So, uh, can you see me okay? Everybody? Okay. <laughs> Easter is the one weekend where I can dress up like an Easter egg and just fit right in, you know? What would it have been like? Think about this. What if you could have been there for the first one? For the first one. What, what if you were one of the people that followed Jesus, you know, and you saw him go from town to town, you saw him heal people? You saw him raise his best friend from the dead? You, you, you saw him teach like nobody had ever taught before. What would that be like? And then how about experiencing Holy Week? The very first day, people are just cheering, Hosanna. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And they're calling out his name. And, and then what if you were there Friday? And you never saw that one coming. There he is hanging on a cross and everything that you had lived for, everything that you had given up everything else for is dead. Hope is gone. But what if you were one of those that went to the tomb on that early Sunday morning? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine getting there and peeking in? Now, now we, 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 obviously we weren't there. We can't be there. But we have eyewitness accounts. And I want to read one of those uh, this morning uh, from John chapter 20 and verses one through nine. It says this. It says, early on a Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. And she ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Who, who was that? The, the guy that wrote the book, John. <laughs> Wants to point out, Jesus loves me. <laughs> in fact, six times in the book, that's how he refers to himself. <laughs> Jesus loved me most. He loved me. Okay. So anyway, just, where were we at? So she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, started out for the tomb, and they were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. <laughs> you know, when you write the book, you can, you can say anything you want to, and he wants, he wants you to know, not only did Jesus love me, but I'm a fast runner too. Yeah. You can't make this stuff up? <laughs> so he stooped and he looked in and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. And then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings and while the cloth that had been covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first. <laughs> also went in and he saw and he believed. He saw the empty tomb and it changed him forever. He believed. His life was radically different. His, his future uh, was not what he had dreamed that it would be. It was, it was in, incredible, incredible. Why? Because of the empty tomb. And so uh, while we couldn't be there, we do have a better perspective now about what it was all about. And what I, what I want to do is I want to take just a few minutes and I want to talk to you about what the empty tomb says to you and I today, 2,000 years later, okay? And let me give you just a couple, three ideas. First one is, it says that God's love is unconditional. God's love is unconditional. That's what the tomb says. Now, that's a hard concept to get your head around because almost all of our relationships are transactional. Would you agree with that? They're not unconditional. I mean, you're gonna go to work tomorrow, and you know, you'll work a full day or work a full week or they'll pay you at the end of the week or every two weeks and it's a transaction. You, you give and they give and everybody's happy with that. You go to a restaurant, you order a meal and uh, the wait service comes and you tip them because you're generous uh, people because you're believers and you're not chintzy and tight. <laughs> so you give them at least 20% and the wait staff says amen. And, uh, but, but it's a transactional relationship, right? Uh, even friendships, 
Have you ever been in a friendship where you either had the thought or you actually complained about it being a one-way relationship? Anybody here? Don't raise your hand. That person might be here. <laughs> but you go, you know, you, you go like this. You go, it seems like I'm the one that's giving the most. I give and I give and I give. And it feels kind of one-sided. Well, if it was unconditional love that you were giving, it wouldn't matter. Okay, right? Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that that ought to be your attitude because it's not necessarily right or wrong there, but I'm just trying to point out that in our friendships, it's transactional. It's, it's on several levels. It's not unconditional. Even marriage. You know, you go and stand before a preacher and you say something like, till death do us part in sickness and in health for better, for worse. You're so committed to that. And it sounds so awesome. But in reality, your love is not unconditional. It's transactional. Um, you ever read the book Five Love Languages or know anything about it? Gary Chapman wrote that. And a lot of people, very popular book. And, and what he says is that we each have different languages that we hear love in. That's why when you express love to somebody close to you and they don't quite get it, sometimes it's because you're expressing it in your language, not theirs. And so those that are really good at marriage, they go, I'm gonna learn my spouse's love language and I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can communicate in that way. And I don't, I don't know how many times I've heard this over my 30 years here. Uh, somebody else, usually the guys, will say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving and I'm giving and I'm trying to communicate in her language and I got nothing coming back my direction. Well, if it was unconditional love, it wouldn't matter. And I'm not trying to make you feel guilty because that's okay, that's kind of not where we are. What I want to do is I want to contrast our transition, transactional love with God's unconditional love. That's what makes it absolutely amazing. In fact, take a look at this. Romans 5 and verse 6 says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's interesting, he says, at just the right time, Jesus came when we were powerless. And I would go, is that the right time? I mean, you know, we, we feel like if we're gonna relate to God, we even do this today in church. You know, so, some of us stay away from church because we say our life's kind of screwed up. Well, that's exactly when you need God. All of our lives are screwed up. Some of us just look better and hide it better than everybody else. It just, but when I had nothing to offer to God, he said, that, that's the right time. And he poured out his amazing, amazing grace on us. See, when we say that God's love is unconditional, what we're saying is that there's nothing that we can do to make him either love us more or love us less. You, you can't, you can't. On your worst day, he loves you. Just as much as he loves you on your best day because it's not conditional. We don't earn his love by fulfilling this predetermined set of conditions. He loves us not because of what we are, but because of who he is, and he, God, is love. See? The stone was gonna roll away, regardless of what we did. Jesus was always gonna come for us, because that's what unconditional love is. The question is this, how will we respond? How will we respond to God's unconditional love? I'll talk to you about that, some ideas in just a few minutes. Second uh, thing that the tomb teaches us is that God's power is bigger than my problems. God's power in an empty tomb shows me that his power is bigger than my problems. How many of you have problems? Anybody have problems? Yeah, a few. Yeah. I mean, would you agree that most of our problems are first world problems? Things like, I can't find the clicker. What are we going to do? Where is it? This could ruin my day. You know, back in the day, they used to have this dial. Some of you kids, no idea. They had this dial up there, and you could just kind of dial it up. Where you now there's no dot. There's nothing. You lose this, and it's a bad day, baby. Huh? Would you agree with that? 
And then here's another one. Have you ever, have you ever, uh, end of the day, you come home, it's, it's my uh, smartphone, and, and you come home at the end of the day, and um, uh, you're ready to go to bed, and it's on 2%. Anybody ever been there, 2%? And so you plug it in on the nightstand by your bed, you climb into bed, and you get like really, you know, like cozy and feeling good, and all of a sudden you remember that you need to check one more Instagram deal. And so you grab your phone, and you pull it, and it, that's the moment you realize you have a problem. The cord is not long enough to come clear up onto the bed, and you're already in there. How many of you have been there? Have you been there? What do you do? You get out of bed, you get down on the floor like this because you can't get any closer. It's a good time to take a selfie because you look good. Okay. Problems. You know what's even worse is when your phone runs out of power during the daytime. When you get that little notification, 10%, 10%, it's like you go into panic survival mode. You know, you just, you try to, you, 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 you try to ration the use of your phone just like a soldier rations his water supply on the front line because these two situations are exactly the same. <laughs> these are problems. Well, as terrible as these are, Yours might be bigger, and it might be more serious. Jesus was. His problem was he's hanging on a cross. Um, his oppressors are arguing over who gets his stuff while he's being tormented. And his followers have scattered. About the only people that are left are his mother and a couple of friends and John, the disciple that he loved. And then he does this. He cried out with a loud voice, and breathed his last. He's dead. The end. It's over. Made a great run. Great run. But now he's done. Would you agree that being dead is a pretty big problem? Especially when you've come and proclaimed that you are the son of God. Hard to think of a bigger problem. But death is the most powerful weapon that the devil has. In fact, the Bible calls it the last enemy. It's if we were gonna be honest, just about everybody in here, uh, maybe you don't fear death, a lot of people do, but it's the unknown. Wish you didn't have to go through it. And Jesus is dead. Jesus is dead. But you know what? To God, that was nothing. Overcoming death is the most natural thing in the world for the author of life. And here's what he wants to do with you. There, there may be a death. Uh, it could be a death of a dream, a death of a career, a death of a relationship, a death of hope itself. It could be the death of a, of a loved one. You know what? God wants you to experience his power this Easter, which is greater than your problems. I want you to hear a story. It's a fellow seacoaster that went through a very, very difficult situation. She'll explain how God's power uh, was bigger than her problem. Scott and I were together for nine years total. Uh, five of those, we were married. We wanted to take some time for our marriage and establish that, and then we decided to have a baby. Um, so we got pregnant with Sullivan, and two weeks after he was born is when everything happened with Scott. It was a beautiful day. That's one thing that I am very thankful for. We woke up and had a wonderful breakfast together. And uh, we went to this barbecue. It was beautiful. We came back, gave Sullivan his first bath. We decided that we were going to watch a movie together. And about 10 minutes into the movie, at least it seemed that, I started to feel him press up against me. But then it was a little bit too hard and for too long, just so I knew it wasn't playing. And I got up and I looked at Scott and his pupils were dilated. It was like he was having some kind of seizure. I, had, I got him on the floor and was administering CPR until the paramedics got there and, and they took over. 
the the police you know, took me into the into the kitchen and I, I kept staring at the stove through the whole through the whole time, just watching the time go by because as time ticked on, I knew that the brain can't live that long without oxygen and I I knew that as the paramedic came and told me I already knew because it was 20 minutes 30 minutes 40 minutes and I remember praying you know obviously I'm praying for God to save Scott but I also was praying, please don't let me lose my faith in this because I know people do. The way everything happened, I believe that God made it happen that way precisely so that I would be able to process it better and I would be able to heal. Because I could have been asleep. And every other night since Sullivan had been born, I was asleep at that time. And I could have come downstairs not knowing what happened, not been able to be there, not been able to do everything that I could. You know, there's a lot of things that I could be questioning but I don't feel that. You know, I, I'm, I don't feel I need to ask why, and I don't feel anger because of it. I, I'm sad and I miss him, but I'm not mad at God over it. Lately, there's been a Psalm that I've been praying about and, and just that has brought me comfort through this whole process and it's Psalm 139, and part of it talks about how God knows you from the moment that you're conceived and, and knows every day that you're going to be on this earth. So he already knew that Scott was going to pass away 29, right after his son was born. He knew that I was going to be sitting here 27 years old with a brand new baby and a new widow. And I believe that because he knew that, he, everything that has happened in my life to make me a strong person, to develop me as a person, was to prepare me for this moment where I have to be strong for Sullivan. It's quiet and can be lonely and when you're all alone at two in the morning with a, a newborn baby. and. When I have nothing left, I just pray and I ask God to come and hold us because I don't know what I'm going to do. And those times I'm just overwhelmed with everything. And I have felt Him, just this calming peace wash over me. And I know that that's the Holy Spirit, I know it. I just lean into the promise that Jesus Christ gave us by coming down on earth and dying on the cross for all of us. And knowing that death is only a separation, that it's not the end, that it's just the beginning of an eternity with God. And that's where Scott is right now. And I. I'm okay with that and that makes me smile. So I can't think of a more difficult circumstance than that. Puts my problems into perspective. One thing that uh, Sandra, I mean, she, she's amazing and her faith is amazing and she's been through the, you know, the really tough, tough times. It's got a grief share here in our church, which is a group that helps a lot of people with that. One of the things that really stood out to me is she understood that God's power 
was bigger than her problem. She cried out. But her faith was in the idea that this wasn't the end. And that's the third thing that I wanna talk to you about. God's love is unconditional. His power is bigger than my problem. But God's future is better than my past. That's what the tomb says. It says God's future is better than my past. You know, after... uh, the cross, the disciples are devastated and some of them are gonna quit, they're gonna go back to fish. They don't know what they're gonna do. Discouraged and, um, because, it, because it didn't look like they had a future that was anywhere close to what their past had been. And when you're in a present circumstance that's hard or full of problems, it's hard to look to the future with hope. Some of you are there today. It's, it's real hard to go, you know, how can tomorrow be, be better? Or maybe my best days are behind me. Well, Jesus taught the disciples before the crucifixion, which they didn't understand. But he came to them and he said, you know what? Things are gonna change. It's gonna be a rough season coming up. He says this. He says, in this world, you're gonna have problems. You're gonna have trouble. But then he goes on and he says, but I have overcome the world. And I wanna give you something to look forward to. Take a look at this. In John 14, it says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. He's talking about heaven. He's talking about the future. He's talking about where he's gonna take them to. They don't understand it. He said, uh, if it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to go there and prepare a place for you? One of the things he's saying is, is that when you see an empty tomb, you know that God's got a better future for you than where you've come from. I, uh, and he wants them to think about that. So a couple of weeks ago, some friends of mine, uh, D- Debbie, I, I t- took us out to eat and went to a, they said, we're, we're gonna go someplace new. And I said, great, I love new things. And this is a good, good restaurant and the food was incredible. It really was, but that wasn't the best part. I dropped Debbie off to go into the restaurant. I went to park the car, and as I was walking back to the restaurant, I walked by a store that I've been to before. It's a gelato store. Anybody know anything about gelato? (laughs) It just looks like this. And then this is uh, Wikipedia. Gelato is made with a base of milk, cream, and sugar, and flavored with fruit, nuts, purees, and other flavorings. In other words, it's got all the food groups in it. It says it is generally lower in fat than other styles of ice cream, so it's it's healthy. And (laughs) gelato typically contains less air and more flavoring than other kinds of frozen dessert, giving it, and I want you to say this together with me, giving it a density and richness. Say that again. A density and richness that distinguishes it from other ice creams. I gotta tell you something. That night we had a great meal. But during that meal, from time to time, my mind would wander (laughs) to that density and richness. And I knew I had to talk those with me into going there. (laughs) And so, I almost felt bad. I had to lie to the wait staff when they came and said, "Um, would you like some dessert? Not from you, I don't. But I wouldn't say that. (laughs) I would... I was thinking about, I was thinking about the future here that my future is going to be even better than my past because what's out there for me. How of you would say amen to the fact that a great dessert makes even a bad meal tolerable? (laughs) And we had a good meal. But uh, I I don't know what kind of meal that you've been served in life. I don't know what kind of meal that is around you right now. But here's what I do know. The Apostle Paul says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. No matter what's in your past, no matter what you're going through right now, God's future is better. You know, Seacoast is 30 years old today. I drove in, I was kind of nostalgic. I played some of the same music at full volume, as I did 30 years ago when I was going to that movie theater that first week, we were wondering if anybody would show up, you know? But I don't ever wanna hear, hey, we're gonna celebrate 30 years after the first of the year when we get our new building done. If you ever put off a birthday, that's what we're gonna do. 
I don't ever want to hear anybody around here talking about the good old days. Because those days were good, but they were just the old days. These are the good new days, and there's even better new days coming. See, if our best days are behind us, let's just shut everything down, make, make way for somebody whose best days are ahead of them. See, I believe, we really do believe that Seacoast Church has only experienced a fraction of what God has prepared for us. I really believe that. Here's what I believe about you. You've only experienced a fraction of what God has prepared for you. Your mind can't even conceive what he's got for you. See, if there's one thing that I want you to know and I want you to walk away with today, it's this, your future that God has planned for you is immeasurably better than anywhere you've been. I don't care whether you're 80 years old or eight years old, but here's what I talked about in the very beginning. Let me just kind of wrap it together. God's love is unconditional and your future begins by receiving God's unconditional love for you. Why is that? Do we have any sinners in the room? Just real quick raise of hands, <laughs> sinners. Man, what a holy section. You guys are so pure. <laughs> just wanna hang out with you guys. Bunch of liars. Okay, now let's do it again. How many sinners do we have in the room? Yeah, here's the problem with that. We're all sinners, but sin throws sand in the gears of life. In fact, Romans 6 says, for the wages, the return from sin is what? It's death. It's the final enemy. Death to a relationship. Death to a marriage. Death to a career. Death in life. See, God never intended man and woman to be mortal. We were created to be immortal, but sin robbed that from us, and death came. But for the free gift of God is eternal life. In other words, you don't have to die forever. It's eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. How does that work? For this is how God loved the world, for he gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. One more. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everybody who believes, no matter who we are, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of the glorious standard. And yet God, in his grace, his unconditional love, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Jesus Christ when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Your future begins by receiving God's unconditional love for you. Everybody in this place is the same in that sin is stolen from us. Everyone in this place has access to God's amazing grace and eternal life through Jesus Christ. But not everybody in this place has received God's unconditional love. We are made right. We receive eternal life by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. I wanna challenge everybody here, everybody that's listening to me, everybody in every building. Don't miss it. Don't walk away this Easter without internalizing, appropriating for yourself, receiving God's unconditional love through faith in Jesus Christ. Could we bow for prayer? here and in every room that we're in, just kinda, just kinda put your head down just for a minute. Just kinda close yourself in where there are no distractions, it's just kinda you and God. And I wanna ask you this question. Have you received God's unconditional love, which is eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ? If that was your loved one, Sandra was in that story, would they be confident that they would see you again because you have eternal life? We'd be to, together forever. That's the best gift anybody could give somebody else is to know that, that regardless of what happens here, that we will have eternal life. Here's what I wanna do. I wanna ask you, your head's bowed. I wanna ask you, have you received it? If, you have, if you're not sure, or if you're saying, you know, today I need to, or, you know, I, I was walking with God at one point and I've been so distant these days. Would you pray for me?
you want to receive eternal life, here's what I want you to do. Here and in the campuses, our campus pastors are coming to the front right now. Here and in the campuses, I'm going to count to three. And then I want you just to raise your hand, okay? Not a gimmick, just gives us a starting place. You raise your hands, and then I want to pray for you, okay? So you, you want to receive eternal life and know for sure that you have received God's unconditional love. Raise your hand on three. One, two, three. Would you just raise your hand all over this building? All over this building. All over this building. Wow. Wow. It's incredible. It's incredible. I want to receive eternal life. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for you in the campuses. I'm going to pray for you here. God, I, I pray right now for everybody who has acknowledged their need of you. We receive eternal life through Jesus Christ. In fact, repeat after me, will you do that? I receive eternal life through Jesus Christ. Would you just say that? I receive eternal life through Jesus Christ. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. And thank you for your offer of life eternal. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.